All right, more fun with databases. I was thinking how, you know, I always think about how what I'm going to say in class and all that, which is, you know, a good idea. More people ought to think before they say things. <laughs>
beginning to start off. You're right, we didn't really talk about that. We talked about primary keys, and you should get the idea that the primary key is something that's pretty important, right? Because remember what the role of a primary key is in a table. A primary key, two characteristics of it. Um, we'll, give two, we'll give the two defining characteristics of it, then we'll give a little more descriptive stuff. One is that every row has to have one. No nulls allowed. Nulls are sort of like empty values. They're different than like zero and they're different than like spaces. They're like no value. All right? A null value is no value at all. Think of it this way, you know. Uh, let's say that I, 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 there's one person I knew, and there might be more, but there's one person that I knew of that didn't have a middle initial. He had a first name and last name. So what's his middle initial? Well, it isn't like zero. It isn't like a blank. He doesn't have a blank for a middle initial. He has no middle initial. All right? Liberace has no last name, right? He's just, or maybe he has no first name. He's Liberace. It's not like his first name or last name is Spaces. All right, that's a whimsical example, but, but anyhow, we'll go on. So that's a difference. That'd be like asking, what is the amount of my uh, checking account balance at, um, at uh, what, what would be a bank, at, at third, fifth bank? I can't say it's zero, right? Because zero means that I have a checking account and the, the, the deposits and withdrawals equal zero. You know, the net of those equals zero. I don't have a checking account at that bank. So if you're to ask what my balance was, it would be a no balance because I don't have a checking account there. All right. So that's the first restriction on a primary key is that every row has to have one. No nulls allowed. No exceptions to this. Uh, one thing that we talked about last time, uh, we talked about a little bit about constraints. and We talked about foreign key constraints. All right. And we said with the foreign key constraints that the column in one table had to match up with a primary key in another table. When you implement these constraints, like when you say in your database that something's a primary key, you can't, by hook or by crook, get something in there that doesn't have a value for that. So it's not like this is a suggestion, or that this is like it's a pretty good idea, or yeah, this is the case most of the time, but you know, if you go in through, you can somehow manipulate it to allow it. Nope. Every row has to have one. That's an absolute constraint. The other thing is it needs to be unique. Unique meaning that a value only appears once. So no duplicates. All right? No duplicates. Now, that's the definition of a, a, of a primary key. Let's talk about descriptions of primary keys. All right? First of all, a primary key can have one or several columns. In other words, a primary key isn't just necessarily one field. It can be a combination of fields. I'll give me an example of this. Let's say we had a table for the rooms on campus. We had a room table. All right. Now there's a lot of ways you could do this, but one way to do it would be the room could have a primary key of the building code plus the room number. And my convention is sort of to put asterisks next to the primary key. I don't think that's anything official, but I've seen it done and, and, and I like it because that, 
the key is so important that we want to be sure we identify it. Then maybe some of the other attributes might be the capacity of the room. How many people can sit into it? Does it have a projector? And so on down the line. Now in that case, the combination of those two fields is what makes it unique. Put another way, we are in BU205, right? Could we use just the building code to be the primary key? No, because there's a lot of rooms in the BU building. All right, there's BU205, BU203, BU201, BU211. There's a lot of rooms in the business building. Therefore, we couldn't use just the building code to identify a room. All right? If, if you were say, you know, if, if someone were to say in the next two minutes, you know, go to room BU and someone will give you $100, wow, you'd be out of luck, right? Because BU what? BU isn't enough to, de to define a room, all right? And I doubt in two minutes you'd be able to run from room to room to room. Yes? I'll split the money with a few people. I'll split the money with a few people. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, you two bottom well, well, four, you two top four. Yeah, there you go. Well, again, uh, depending on the amount of time, uh, you know, you might run out of time first, or you might find some. Yeah, I didn't find it, and pocket the hundred. There's a lot of problems, <laughs> you know, with that too. All right. At any rate, the building code by itself is not enough to identify a room. Neither is a room number, right? If we were to say the same sort of thing, like go to room 205, well, there's a 205 in this room, uh, building, but there's also a, bit, a 205 in a bunch of buildings on campus, right? This is not the only room 205 on campus. There are other buildings, and I'm sure some of those all uh, have room 205s. But the combination of the two is unique, all right? The combination of the two is unique. <coughs> So, with a primary key, every room, every, every row has to have one, there can't be any duplicates. And in this case, building code and room number suffice, right? There isn't a building that isn't in a, oh, I'm sorry, there isn't a room that isn't in a building, that doesn't have a building code, right? Just a room sitting out there in the middle of the, 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 the court over there. No, there aren't any. Every room is in a building. And every room is numbered. All right. So we could make a primary key of this. All right. Now, one thing about this, uh, one, one last little catch, is that another part of the rule is that a primary key should be minimal. What do I mean by that? In other words, you might say, well, can I include capacity in that? In other words, could I identify the room BU205 by saying BU205, or the, the, the room BU, the number is 205, and its capacity is, looks like 32, give or take. All right. So what room are you are you at? Well, I'm at room BU205. That uh, I'm in room BU205 that has a capacity of 32. You don't need the 32 to identify the room. BU205 is enough. And if anything, that leads to the possibility that um, you could get kind of duplicates. Because what if I think this is BU205 with a capacity of 32, and someone says, well, the capacity is actually 36. Well, you could put BU205 in there twice, and that wouldn't be a good thing. So primary key ought to be minimal. In other words, when you look at a primary key, it should only be the portions needed to uniquely identify. Maybe a better example would be with students, student ID plus last name. All right? You don't need the last name in there. The student ID by itself is enough to identify a student. Therefore, if you made the primary key of the table student ID plus last name, then you'd violate the, the rule of the primary key being minimal. All right. 
So, hierarchy can be one or it can be several columns. Here are some guidelines as far as primary keys go. Shorter is better than longer. Numbers are better than alphanumeric. All right. If you think about it, based on what we talked about last time, the primary key of a table is important. It's important because we're not just going to store it in the table itself. Anything that refers to that table, we're going to use the primary key to point to the particular row that it belongs to. So, for example, it's not just that the student ID is in the student table. The student ID is also in the grade table to point to which student got that grade. It's in the degree table to say what student got awarded that degree. It's in the class schedule table to say what student is enrolled in this particular class, and so on. So because of that, the motivation is, is to make this smaller. All right, that, you know, smaller, less space to store, things can be traversed more quickly. A lot of good things happen if the key is smaller. All right. So shorter, better than longer. So. If you had the choice, for example, this is just a for example because this really wouldn't work. If we were to make a person's cell phone number versus uh, their student ID, you might say, well, let's make the cell phone number the student ID uh, again. Let's forget for a second that there are some people in the world that don't have cell phones. All right, let's assume that everyone has a cell phone. If we made the cell phone number, that would be 44 almost gave my cell phone number out there for the world to call. That'd be like 10 characters, right? Yeah, 10 digits. Student number is six digits. So six digits is less than 10. So we'd be saving space, all right? Not to mention the fact, of course, that there could be a person that shares a cell phone with someone, so there would be duplicates, and there might be people that don't have cell phones. But again, we'll forget about that. The shorter the field, the better. And numbers are better than alphanumeric simply because computers can store numbers in a more efficient manner than it can store uh, letters. For example, um, you could store in two characters two bytes worth of space. You could store the numbers from 0 to 65,000 and change, if I'm doing the math right, plus 256 squared. In two characters worth of data, you could store the numbers between 1 and 65,000. If you throw a third digit in, a third byte rather, you could store uh, into 16 million. So with three characters, you could store 16 million different student numbers, all right, if it's a numeric student. So you can you actually get more bang for your buck. You could store a eight digit number in three characters. What can you store in three characters if it's alphanumeric? You can store three characters. <laughs> All right. So therefore you get a lot more bang for your buck if you're storing numbers. Now the other thing I would say is that These is hard to argue. You're not going to find anyone making an argument saying, no, longer primary keys are better. Um, 
you also aren't going to make anyone make the argument to say no. Um, alphabetic uh, keys are better. This last one you might get someone to debate. I'll, I'll, I'll spare you the details of the debate. But my preference is for single part keys. over multiple part keys. So, so like a capital T. Repeat that please. Like a capital T. Then now that's shift and then T, that's two. Is that what you mean by multi part keys? I don't understand what you mean with that. Well we gave an example up there with the room oh, table. Okay. With the room table there's two parts to that key. I see. Okay. There's uh there's a building code and there's a room number. So two fields. Single field. Keys. Single field. Gotcha. I'm sorry. Yeah. So single part keys are the preference. So in other words, one field better than multiple. And that's that's partly my bias, but I could make a strong argument, I think. All right. So the question that was asked a while ago was what are candidate keys? I was talking a little bit in the lab about candidate keys or, or um, um, maybe it was read in a book or, or something. You know, great season of the year to be talking about candidate keys. You know. What is a candidate? A candidate is someone, and we'll give a simple definition, and we will remain objective here and, and not editorialize at all, but a candidate is a person that could be selected for a position. Right? You have candidates running for president. One of them, or let's put it this way, any of them right now could be selected as president. But when push comes to shove, right, only one of them is going to be selected. It's not like, gee, you guys both did such a good job campaigning that you get to be president in January, February, March, April, May, and June, and then you get the rest. No. So any of them could be selected, but one of them will be selected. All right? So that's a, that's a candidate in real life. Candidate keys are where you have a couple possibilities that could be primary keys. But again... Just like with president, you got to select one, you got to select one. So let's think of an example of primary, uh, of candidate keys. We have an employee table, let's say. We're, we're, we're doing our employees, all right? Each employee has an employee number. I have an employee number right here at LC. I also have a social security number. Now, is employee number and social security number candidate keys? All right. Well, let's think it through. Every row has to have one. Is that true? Does every employee have to have a social security number? I'm pretty sure they do. All right. And will it be unique? Will there be no duplicates? Yeah, I'm pretty sure that those are unique. All right. So a social security number could be the primary key to the database. Could employee number be a, 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 a key in, in that employee table? Absolutely. Does every employee have an employee number? Yep. Are they unique? Yep. So, we have two fields that could be the primary key. Now, from what we said before, just like you can't have two folks president and split in the time or combine them or something like that, you can't then say, well, okay, since both of them can be primary key, I'll make the combination of them the primary key. No, that validates the rule of, of minimal primary keys, right? Because the social security number is enough on its own, the student or the, the faculty ID is enough on its own. So therefore, you don't combine them. That violates, again, the rule that a primary key needs to be minimal, as small as it can be. So, how do you decide which gets to be the primary key and which doesn't get to be the primary key? Well, these rules sort of give you some idea. All right? They're both single part, so you don't really 
get any benefit there, right? A social security number is one number. An employee number is one number. They're both numbers, all right? Um, so you really don't get any benefit there. But an employee number is shorter than a social security number. Social security numbers are like nine digits long, and employee numbers are like six digits long, all right? So on this criteria, employee number would get the nod as compared to social security number. Now, in this specific example, um, given the fact that there are private privacy and security issues associated with social security numbers, um, that might be another argument for not using it as a primary key. You know, limit where it's going to accidentally appear on a report or something like that. All right. So that's an example of a primary key. Either one of them would be potential selections for a primary key. All right. But you got to pick one, so you apply the criteria. These factors, along with any other factors that may be unique to the situation. The one thing I would also urge you to say would be, be sure that your candidates really are qualified candidates, that they, that they meet the eligibility requirement. You know, my daughter could say, hey, I'm running for president. I'm a candidate. No, she doesn't fit the rule. She's not 35 years old, all right? Likewise, if I were to say, what about employee email address, all right? Yeah, everyone has an email address, and there's not going to be any unique. Well, is that really true? Does everyone really have an email address? Uh, I don't know. Do you want to be guaranteed that that email address is going to be unique, and you don't have two people that share that? Well, I don't know. So I guess the question is that if you're evaluating whether someone fits that or not, uh, or uh, if, you're, if you're evaluating how to choose between two candidate keys, be sure they're both really candidates. Yeah, you have a question? I was going to say they also change their email addresses all the time, so that will make it worse. Yeah, that's, an, uh, that, that's a good point. That's another criteria that... Unchanging is better than changing. All right, so yeah, that's another criteria. Right, and in this particular case, it is that. But again, you know, think of phone number. That might be a good example, too. Does everyone have a phone? Really? Are you not going to hire someone because they don't have a phone? All right. And is it possible that two people would be sharing the same phone? Yeah, absolutely. All right. So, again, defining the primary key, again, be sure you're, you know, examine it and decide, hey, does it meet this criteria? All right. If you have more than one that meets this criteria, apply this sort of thinking to it. And again, I'll put for the Social Security maybe other special considerations like Social Security number and try to keep private. Now, is it possible that when you look at a table, all right, when you look at a table, there aren't any candidate keys. Yeah, I suppose there is, right? Let's say we were, well, let me rephrase that. Let's say it may be possible that no immediate ideas pop into your head for primary key among the field 